Chapter One of the Story of Robin Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The Story of Robin Hood by Bertha Evangeline Bush. Stories of Robin Hood. And what of Peter the Plowman? He was a good friend of mine. Alack, Peter the Plowman hath been hanged, and his wife and little ones turned out of their home to beg. The father of young Robin Hood, with his little son at his side, had met a man from his old home, and was eagerly questioning him about the welfare of his old neighbors. But much of the news was sad, for the times were evil in England. The Normans had conquered the country, and were the lords and officials in the land, and they cruelly oppressed the common people, who were Saxons. The father said not a word, although his face grew very sad. But the boy beside him burst out indignantly. "'But why should such a thing be done? Peter the Plowman was one of the best men I ever knew, and his wife was as good and kind as an angel. Why should such a dreadful thing be done to them?' "'Because he shot deer in the king's forest. But, indeed, he had an excuse for breaking the law, if ever a man did. His crops had been destroyed by the huntsmen riding through them. The tax collector had taken all that he had, and his children were crying for hunger.' He shot the deer that they might have food to eat, but the sheriff caught him and hung him for it. As to the reason why his wife was turned out from her home with her orphan children, the abbot wanted that bit of ground for an extension to his garden, so out the poor folks must go. "'It's a shame!' cried the boy with flashing eyes. "'Such laws as that are wicked laws and ought to be broken. The greedy lords and rich, ease-loving churchmen strip the people bare and go rolling in wealth while the rest of the people are starving.' "'Hush, boy, hush!' said the news-teller warningly. Our England is indeed cruelly misgoverned, but it is not safe to say so, for the very walls have ears, and many have been hanged because their tongues wag too freely as well as for shooting the king's deer. "'But the king! The king is good!' faltered the boy. He had been taught to love and reverence the king. The king would be a good king if he would stay at home and govern his people, but he is off at war all the time, and the nobles and officers he appoints grind the people as a miller grinds the wheat between his great millstones. They rob them continually, and the rich are growing richer and more greedy, and the poor growing poorer and more miserable all the time. "'When I am a man,' said the boy, Robin Hood, "'I will make the rich give up a portion of their wealth to the poor, and then all will be provided for.' It was not strange, perhaps, considering the evils of the times, that this boy, Robin Hood, when he became a man, did do just what he said, and gathered a band of men about him in the forest, whose pledged purpose was to despoil the rich of ill-gotten wealth and lend a helping hand to the poor. The Normans called them highway robbers, but the common people called them the merry men of Greenwood, and loved them, for they were often helped out of trouble by them. Their robbing was certainly wrong according to our standards, but Robin Hood did not think it was wrong. He took from the rich what they had wrung unjustly from the poor, to give it back to the poor, and he thought that it was right. Outlaw though he was, he stood ever for justice and fairness as he saw it. He was loyal to the king, though he resisted the unjust exactions made in the king's name. He was loyal to the church, and prayed most reverently for himself and his band. It was his pride that he and his men had never harmed a woman, or burned a haystack, or robbed a husbandman, or hurt a parish priest. The Normans did all these things. Compared with their actions, Robin Hood's standards were wonderfully high. He was trying to be a reformer, and though he went about his work in a wrong way, still he did much good. As the quaint old ballad says about him, in queer spelling which I revise, Christ have mercy on his soul that died on the road, for he was a good outlaw and did poor men much good. He was brave and kind and merry always, and all the English people, except England's oppressors, loved him with all their hearts and delighted in his adventures. The story of what he did was put into songs and sung at every fireside, and no man was better loved than this outlaw with a price upon his head. Here are a few stories of Robin Hood and his men, and a great many more may be found which are well worth your reading. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of The Story of Robin Hood – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Robin Hood 
by bertha evangeline bush winning the sheriff's golden arrow it was very pleasant in sherwood forest to those who did not fear hardship and robin hood and his men came to love every tree that grew and every bird that sang there they did not mind that they had no houses to live in they made themselves shelters of bark and logs to keep the rain off and mostly they stayed in the open they did not sigh for soft beds or fine tables and furnishings they put down rushes and spread deer skins over them to lie on and slept under the stars they cooked over a great fire built beside a big tree and they sat and ate on the ground more than a hundred men were in robin hood's band every one was devoted to him and obeyed his slightest word they were the best archers the best wrestlers the best runners and the best wielders of cudgel and quarter-staff in all the country and they grew better continually for they practised these things every day robin hood was the best archer in all the land even the king had heard of his wonderful marksmanship and even though he knew him an outlaw he had an admiring and almost kindly feeling for this bold outlaw who shot so marvellously well but the greedy lords and churchmen who oppressed the people hated robin hood and the sheriff of nottingham hated him most of all and wished above all things to hang him on the gallows he was a cruel hard man with no kindness in his bosom and all his spite was turned against robin hood because every time that he tried to catch him robin outwitted him now he was especially angered for he had sent a messenger with a warrant to take robin hood and the merry robin had met the messenger and feasted him and then while he was asleep after the feast stolen the very warrant out of his pocket so that he had to go back to the sheriff without man or warrant either so the sheriff of nottingham used all his wits to get another plan to take robin hood it was plainly of no use to send men no matter how stout with warrants after him he must be coaxed into their clutches i have it said the sheriff of nottingham at last with a very sour look on his grim face i'll catch him by craft i'll proclaim a great archery festival and get all the best archers in england to come here to shoot i'll offer for the prize an arrow of beaten gold that will be sure to fetch robin hood and his men here and then i'll catch them and hang them now robin hood and his men did come to the archery contest but they did not come in the suits of lincoln green that they wore as men of the forest each man dressed himself up to seem somebody else some appeared as barefoot friars some as travelling tinkers or tradesmen some as beggars and some as rustic peasants robin hood was the hardest to recognize of all don't go master his men had begged this archery contest is just a trap to catch you the sheriff of nottingham and his men will be looking for you and they will know you by your hair and eyes and face and height even if you wear different clothes the sheriff has made this festival just to lure you to death don't go but robin hood laughed merrily why as to my yellow hair i can stain that with walnut stain as to my eyes i can cover one of them with a patch and then my face will not be recognized i would scorn to be afraid and if an adventure is somewhat dangerous i like it all the better so robin hood went clad from top to toe in tattered scarlet the raggedest beggar man that had ever been seen in nottingham the field where the contest was to be held was a splendid sight rows and rows of benches had been built on it for the gentlefolk to sit on and they wore their best clothes and were gayer than birds of paradise as for the sheriff and his wife they wore velvet the sheriff purple and his lady blue their rich garments were trimmed with ermine they wore broad gold chains around their necks 
and the sheriff had shoes with wondrously pointed toes that were fastened to his gold embroidered garters by golden chains oh they were dressed very splendidly and if their faces had been kind they would have looked beautiful but their faces were full of pride and hate the sheriff was looking everywhere with spiteful glances for robin hood and very cross he was that he did not see robin there but robin was there though the sheriff did not see him there he stood in his ragged beggar's garments not ten feet away from the sheriff the targets were placed eighty yards from where the archers were to stand pace that off and see what a great distance it is there were a great number of archers to shoot and each was to have one shot then the ten who shot best were to shoot two arrows each and the three who shot best out of the ten were to shoot three arrows apiece the one who came nearest to the centre of the target was to get a prize the sheriff looked gloweringly at the ten i was sure that robin hood would be among them he said to the man-at-arms at his side could no one of these ten be robin hood in disguise no answered the man-at-arms six of these i know well they are the best archers in england there is jill of the red cap dickon crookshank adam of the dell william a leslie hubert a cloud and swithin a hartford of the four beside one is too tall and one too short and one not broad-shouldered enough to be robin hood there remains only this ragged beggar and his hair and beard are much too dark to be robin hood's and beside he is blind in one eye robin hood is safe in sherwood forest even as he spoke the man-at-arms was glad for he was but a common soldier and he loved robin hood and wished no harm to come to him one reason why robin hood got away from the sheriff so many times was that the common people even among the sheriff's own men were friendly to him and helped him all they could the gatekeepers shut their eyes when robin hood went through the gates that they might say they had not seen him enter hardly any one would betray him and many when they knew of evil being planned against him sent warning to him but even the man-at-arms who loved him did not recognize robin hood to-day the ten made wonderful shots not one arrow failed to come within the circles that surrounded the centre but when the three shot it was more wonderful still jill of the red cap's first arrow struck only a finger's breadth from the centre and his second was nearer still but the beggar's arrow struck in the very centre adam of the dell who had one more shot unstrung his bow when he saw it fourscore years and more have i shot shaft and beaten many competitors but i can never better that he said the prize of the golden arrow belonged to the tattered beggar but the sheriff's face was very sour as he gave it to him he tried to induce him to enter his service promising great wages you are the best archer i have ever seen he said i trow you shoot even better than that rascal and coward of a robin hood who dared not show his face here to-day will you join my service no i will not answered the scarlet-clad stranger and then the sheriff looked at him so spitefully that he knew it was well to get away as he walked toward sherwood forest the sheriff's words rankled i cannot bear to have even my enemy think that i am a coward he said to little john i wish there was a way to tell the sheriff that it was robin hood that won his golden arrow and they found a way that evening the sheriff sat at supper and though the supper was a fine one his face was gloomy i thought i could catch that rascal robin hood by means of this archery contest he said to his wife but he was too much of a coward to show his face here just then something came through the window and fell rattling among the dishes on the table it was a blunted grey goose quill with a bit of writing tied to it the sheriff unfolded the writing 
it told that it was robin hood who had won the golden arrow when the sheriff read it even his wife thought best to slip away for he was the crossest man in nottingham End of chapter 2chapter three of the story of robin hood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the story of robin hood by bertha evangeline bush chapter three how little john joined robin hood this is the story of how robin hood gained his right-hand man and dearest friend little john Little John was one of the tallest and strongest youths that ever walked through a forest. When Robin Hood first saw him, he was walking in the edge of the forest and came to a narrow bridge across a stream. The bridge was so narrow that but one could go across it at once, and it chanced that Robin Hood stepped upon it from one side just as Little John stepped on the other. Go back! and let the better man cross before you called robin hood not because he cared a bit but rather with a mirthful wish to see what the tall youth would do stand back yourself i am the better man cried the stranger let us fight for it said robin hood who loved a good bout more than his dinner with all my heart answered the stranger then robin cut him a stick of oak to serve as a quarter-staff, for he would have held it a shame to use his bow and arrows, when the other had no such weapon, and they met as joyously as two boys wrestling for sport. The one who can knock the other into the water is the better man, said Robin. Then the fight with the staves began. What a fight it was! They struck again and again, but so skillful was each one in warding off blows that neither could knock the other down. Many hard blows each one took, until there were sore bones and bumps, and black and blue spots in plenty, but neither thought of stopping for that. A whole hour they fought there on the bridge, and neither could get the better of the other. Then another hour. At last Robin gave the stranger a terrible whack that made him stagger. But the stranger returned with a crack on the crown that made the blood flow. Robin whacked back at him savagely, but the stranger avoided the blow and gave one to Robin that tumbled him fairly into the water. He lay there, looking up and laughing, for Robin Hood never bore any malice. "'You have a right sturdy hand with that cudgel. Never have I been beaten before,' he laughed. He splashed ashore and seized the stranger's hand. "'I like you well,' he said. "'Now watch.' and I will show you something. He put his horn to his lips and blew, and up came two score of Robin Hood's followers, all clothed in Lincoln green, and bearing bows and arrows and swords. How is this, master? said the foremost. You were all bruised and wet to the skin. Yon sturdy fellow has given me a drubbing and tumbled me into the water, he said. "'Then he shall get a ducking and a drubbing himself,' said Will Stutely, starting forth angrily, followed by half a dozen, all eager to carry out his threat. But Robin Hood ordered him back. "'No,' he said. "'It was a fair fight, and he won. I would not have you hurt him for anything, but he is a right brave and lusty youth, and I would fain have him in our band. Will you join yourself to my men?' he asked of the wandering stranger. I am Robin Hood, and my band is the finest in all England. Hardly a man in the country but would have trembled at the name, but Little John, the strange youth, was afraid of no man. If there is any man among you who can shoot a better shaft than I, I will, he said. Well, I will try, said Robin. He sent Will Stutely to set up a piece of white bark, four fingers in breadth, on an oak eighty yards away. Now choose any of our bows and arrows to shoot with, he said. The stranger chose the very stoutest bow, 
Then he aimed his arrow carefully and sent it down the path, and it struck the very center of the mark. All Robin Hood's followers caught their breaths in amaze. That is a fine shot indeed, said Robin Hood heartily. No one could better it, but perhaps I may mar it. Then he shot an arrow, and so true and swift it sped that it struck the stranger's arrow and splintered it into pieces, and all who saw it cried out that there never was such shooting before. Now will you not come into my band? said Robin Hood with a smile. With all my heart, answered the stranger, and from that minute he loved Robin as his dearest friend. What is your name? said Will Stutely, taking out a tablet as though he would enroll it. John Little, answered the stranger youth. I like not the name, said Mary Will. This fellow is too small to be called John Little. Let us christen him over Little John. And so they had a christening and great sport, and from that day Little John was Robin Hood's right-hand man and second-in-command over the band. True and faithfully did he serve Robin for many years, and loved him better with every year. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Story of Robin Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Robin Hood by Bertha Evangeline Bush, Alan Adale, and Friar Tuck. This is the story of a merry friar, and how he came to belong to Robin Hood's band. But it begins with the story of a sad youth with a harp in his hand who could sing as sweetly as a thrush, but who thought that he would never sing again, for his heart was breaking. Robin Hood and his men found him in the forest, lying prone on the ground, and sobbing as if he would weep his eyes out. "'Get up! Get up!' shouted Will Stutely, poking him with his foot. "'I do hate to see a tall young fellow sniveling like a girl of fourteen over a dead bird.' But Robin Hood bade the others stand back, and touched the boy kindly. "'You are in trouble,' he said. "'Do not mind what these fellows say. They are rough, but their hearts are kind. Come with me and tell me what is wrong.' "'Everything is wrong,' said Alan and Dale miserably, and it was true that things were going very badly with him, for his true love had promised bride had been forced to give him up and promise her hand to a rich old knight who won her father's favor by means of his money.' "'She will marry the old knight if her father bids it,' cried Alan and Dale, "'for she thinks it right to be an obedient daughter. "'But I know it will break her heart, and she will die.' "'Now this thing shall not be,' cried Little John, starting forward. "'Master, can we not prevent such a wrong?' "'We will see,' answered Robin Hood. "'But she is to be married in two days. "'Then we will go to the church and see that she is married to you.' instead of the old knight. But we will need to find a priest who will marry you. Then I know the very priest, said Will Scarlet. It is jolly Friar Tuck, who lives in the Fountain Dale. Then let us go and get him at once. We have no time to lose, said Robin Hood, and out they started without delay. Little John, Will Scarlet, young David of Doncaster, and Arthur of Bland went with him. They wore their best clothes. For, said Robin Hood, we must look brave when we go to a wedding. After they had walked the whole morning, they came to a bend in the river, beyond which Friar Tuck dwelt. But his cell was across the river, and to get to it they would have to wade through. Well, said Robin Hood, had I known I would have had to wade the river, I would not have put on my best clothes. Then he left his men, bidding them listen if his bugle should sound, and went on alone. As soon as he was out of sight of them, he thought he heard voices. There seemed to be two men talking on the river bank below, but the voices were wondrously alike. Robin Hood slipped to the edge and looked over. With his broad back against a willow tree sat a stout, brawny fellow in the robe of a friar, 
but no other man was by. He held a great pie in his lap, made of tender, juicy meats, compounded with young onions and other toothsome vegetables, which he munched at sturdily. As he ate, he talked, and listening to him, Robin Hood almost died of laughing, for the merry friar was pretending to be two people. He would offer a piece of the pastry first to his right hand, and then to his left, with much politeness, and go through the same actions with the bottle of drink that he had. Robin looked and listened till the pie was all gone, and the bottle empty. Then the monk began to urge his imaginary companion to sing. "'Now, sweet lad,' he said to himself, "'canst thou not tune me a song?' And then he answered himself bashfully, "'La, I know not. I am but an ill voice this day. Prithee, ask me not. Dost thou not hear how I croak like a frog?' And he spoke again as the first one. "'Nay, nay, thy voice is as sweet as any bullfinch. Come sing. Prithee, I would rather hear thee sing than eat a fair feast.' And so it went till he began singing, and that was as two persons too. The song he sang was a duet between a youth and a maid, and he sung the maiden's part very high and squeaky, and the youth very deep and gruff. It was the funniest thing you could imagine. And when the last chorus was reached, Robin Hood could hold in no more, but joined in with the lusty singing. Then the friar leaped forth, crying, What? spy have we here and from beneath his monk's robe he drew forth a sword as heavy and stout as any that robin hood's band carried put up thy sword friend called robin folks that have sung together should not fight and then he leaped down beside the friar do you know the country round about good and holy man he asked yes somewhat answered the friar cautiously and do you know a spot called fountain dale and a certain monk who is called the Curtal Friar of Fountain Abbey? Yes, somewhat. Is it across the river? asked Robin Hood. Yes, answered the monk. Do you know whether this friar is now on the other side of the river, or on this side? asked Robin. That, answered the friar very deliberately, is something you will have to find out for yourself. This angered Robin, and indeed it was not at all civil. Well, he said, if I must cross the river, I must ask you to carry me across, for you can see that my clothes are such as the water would injure. At first the friar was angry at the request, but soon a different thought seemed to come to him, and he laughed. Well, he said, if the holy St. Christopher carried pilgrims across the river, perhaps I ought to do so also. Give me your sword that it may not get wet, and I will carry you. So he tucked his own sword and Robin's under his arm and bent his back for Robin to get on it and waded across the water. He put Robin down very gently on the other bank, but he did not give him back his sword. Thanks, good father, said Robin. Give me my sword and I will away. Nay, good youth, answered the friar, pointing the sword at Robin. You see, I got wet crossing the river. It is necessary for me to cross again but I fear if I got wet once more I might get a crick in my back that would hinder my prayers. I pray thee, carry me back. He had the sword, and there was nothing for Robin to do but obey. So he carried the friar back, and it was harder than for the friar to carry him. But while they were in the stream he managed to loosen Friar Tuck's sword belt, so that when they got to land he snatched it off. Now Robin Hood had two swords. Now carry me across again, he said. It is a long story, but the end of it is that Friar Tuck carried Robin Hood halfway across the river and there dumped him into the water to cool off, as he said. Then Robin fought with him, but though they fought together with might and main for hours, neither could overcome the other, and so they ceased to fight and became friends, and Friar Tuck willingly consented to go with him and perform the marriage between Alan a Dale and his fair Ellen, no matter what a pother it raised. So now Robin Hood and a score of his merry men set out to the wedding, which was to be held in Emmet Church. Robin Hood was dressed as a strolling minstrel, and across his shoulders he had slung a harp. 
leaving the most of his followers in hiding a little distance from the church he went boldly it was to be a very grand wedding and the bishop of hereford himself was to perform the ceremony he came with a long train of followers and as he entered he saw robin with his harp beside the door now who are you he asked well pleased for everybody loved to see a minstrel i am a harper from the north country answered robin hood i can play such music as never another in all england can do for there is magic in my harping and if i play at this wedding it will ensure that the fair bride shall love the man she marries with her whole heart all her life long marry then let them play said sir stephen the old bridegroom he knew that it was her father's will instead of her own wish that made the fair ellen marry him but he did not know that she loved another for her father had concealed that from him and now the bride's father brought in the bride and she was the most beautiful maiden they had ever seen but she was pale and wan and she drooped on her father's arm like a broken lily how is this cried robin hood a bride should be like a blushing rose maiden is it of your own free will that you wed with this knight no no sobbed fair ellen i wish to wed no one but my own true love allen a dale the minstrel then allen a dale shall ye wed cried robin hood and he set his bugle to his lips and blew the followers who had entered the church and friar tuck came running down the aisles and gathered around him then came a scene of confusion the bishop of hereford prior of emmet and all his train commanded the people to seize robin hood but they would not do it the old knight who was the bridegroom sought to draw his sword but he wore no sword on his wedding day at them and slay them he cried to his men of arms but just at that minute there came a running up at the double quick the rest of robin hood's men with swords drawn and bows and arrows hanging at their backs i will depart said the bridegroom to the bride's father i would not marry your daughter now for all the kingdom of england he spoke angrily for he felt that he had been cheated not knowing that the maiden loved some one else the prior of emmet calling his train also departed in high displeasure and the bishop of hereford would have gone too but robin bade him stay now he said we will have a wedding and fair ellen shall marry allen a dale you cannot the prior of emmet turned his back to say you have no priest to marry them am i not a priest bellowed friar tuck so fiercely that the prior shook in his pointed shoes and made haste to get away but the bans have not been published said the bride's father i will publish them roared friar tuck and the old song says that he cried them three times the number required by law and then lest they should not be enough he cried them six more but i cannot be married without my father's blessing sobbed ellen for she was ever an obedient daughter there there don't cry said robin hood gently i will get your father's blessing then he called to will stutely give me the two bags of gold i bade you bring he strode up to helen's father with a bag of gold in each hand here are two hundred golden angels he said if you give your daughter your blessing on this her wedding day i will give you these as her dower if you give her not the blessing she shall be married just the same but not a cracked farthing shalt thou have the father looked at the gold and then at robin hood he knew the night was gone and would not come back well he said but not happily i will give her my blessing so the wedding went on and after it was over they went to sherwood forest and held the merriest feast that ever was held in that merry place and allen a dale and his bride lived happily all the rest of their lives and he sang such beautiful songs that his fame went all over england and as for friar tuck he liked robin hood and his band so much that he never went back to fountain dale but became one of robin hood's merry men End of chapter 4
Chapter Five of the Story of Robin Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Robin Hood by Bertha Evangeline Bush. Chapter Five. Robin Hood in the Sorrowful Night. We have had no guests for a long time," said Robin Hood one day. "Let us go and look for some." Little John, you go to the east, and I will go to the west, and we will see if we do not find passing a greedy noble, or fat churchman, who carries too much of this world's goods with him, and needs to be relieved for the good of the poor. Now, when Robin Hood and his men robbed a man, they never molested any but the rich, who had made their wealth by grinding down the poor. They brought him into the forest, and made a feast for him. Then, after he had feasted, they told him he must pay his reckoning, and they took his goods, or gold that he carried, and divided these into three piles. One third they gave back to him, one third they kept for themselves, and the other third they distributed to the poor. The rich and grasping stuttered at the very mention of Robin Hood's feasts, but the poor breathed blessings on his name whenever they thought of him. So Little John and his part of the band went to the east, and they were lucky, for they brought in the rich bishop of Hereford, with five sumpter mules loaded with goods. But Robin Hood in his half found only a sorrowful knight, who sighed as he rode along, and seemed too sad to notice anything. Robin Hood laid his hand on his bridle, stopping his horse. Hold, he said. I would speak with you. Now, who are you, who would stop a peaceful traveller on the king's highway? asked the knight. Some call me an honest man, and some call me a robber, answered Robin Hood. At any rate, I and my men have an inn in the forest where we want you to stop and feast, but we let you know that we count upon our guests paying the reckoning. I take your meaning answered the knight, but I am no guest for you, for I have no money. Indeed, I am in great sorrow by reason of this very thing. Having great need of money to save the life of my son, I mortgaged my estate to the prior of Emmet, and, though I could raise the money, if he would give me more time, he will not give me a day, but means to seize the estate and turn me out a beggar. How much money did you borrow of him? asked Robin Hood. Only four hundred pounds. The estate is worth many times that, but he will show no mercy. Have you no friends who could lend you the money? asked Robin Hood. Alas, no, answered the knight. When I was fortunate, I had many friends who crowded around me, but now that I have come to trouble, they all have deserted me. Well, the men who are in trouble always have friends in Sherwood Forest, answered Robin Hood. Come with me as a free guest, and we will find a way to help you. So they went on, until they came to the great tree where Friar Tuck and half a dozen others were preparing the feast around a huge fire, and there in the light of the flames sat the bishop of Hereford under guard, with his sumpter mules, with their loaded packs tied to the trees around. Have mercy, he whined. But Robin Hood answered sternly, What mercy have you ever shown to the poor? Men, open his packs. So they opened the packs, which were full of rich goods, and divided them up into three parts. Beside the packs of goods, there was a box that held fifteen hundred pounds in gold. Robin Hood took up the portion divided out for the poor, and gave it to the sorrowful knight. Since the churchmen have despoiled you, the churchmen shall help you, he said. Oh, I thank you, cried the knight, his sorrowful face lighting up for the first time that day. But I will not take it as a gift, but as a loan. I will pay it back to the bishop or to you. The bishop nodded and opened his mouth to say, That is well. But Robin Hood interrupted him shortly. Pay it to me, he said. I will help the poor with it. 
the bishop would but crowd it into his own coffers and use it to gain more money. So the knight, who had been so sorrowful, departed with all his troubles cleared away. Sorely disappointed was the prior of Emmet, for he had made sure, by cheating and craft, that the poor knight, who had fallen into his clutches, could not get the money to redeem his lands anywhere, and he counted them already in his grasp. But he had to give them up, and that is a story too, but we have not room to tell it here. End of chapter 5、Robin Hood and the King I wish I could see Robin Hood, said King Richard. I wish I could see him and his men shoot and wrestle and go through all the feats in which they have such wondrous skill. But if they heard that the king was coming, they would think it was only to arrest them, and they would flee deep into the forest, and I should never get a glimpse of them. King Richard spoke kindly, for he was a king who loved all manly sports and those who excelled in them. I would give a hundred pounds to see Robin Hood and his men in the greenwood, he said. I'll tell you how you can see him without a doubt, spoke up one of the king's trusty companions with a laugh. Put on the robes of a fat abbot and ride through Sherwood Forest with the hundred pounds in your pouch, and you will be sure to see him and be feasted by him. I'll do it, cried bluff King Richard, slapping his knee. It will be a huge joke. So he and seven of his followers dressed themselves as an abbot and seven black friars and rode out along the highway toward Sherwood Forest. Robin Hood and his men took them and brought them back to the Trystal Tree, and there they searched them and took the pouch of gold. But they gave half the gold back to the king, for it was not their custom to leave any man in need. They were pleased with these travelers because they did not resist. Nor rail at them. Now we shall give you a feast that will be worth fifty pounds, said Robin Hood. I have a good appetite for a feast, said the pretended abbot, but even more do I desire to see the archery and wrestling and play with the quarter staff and all those things in which I am told you excel. You shall see the best we can do, answered Robin Hood. But I pray you, Holy Father, lay aside your cowl. That you may enjoy the sweet evening air. No, answered the mock abbot, it may not be, for I and my brothers have vowed not to let our faces be seen during this journey. Very well, then, said Robin Hood, I interfere with no man's vows, and he never dreamed that it was the king. They gave them a splendid feast of roasted venison and pheasant and fish and wild fowls. All done to a turn over the roaring fire and the best of drink. Then they arranged the sport. The target was a garland of leaves and flowers that was hung six score paces distant upon a stake. It was a mark that only the best of archers could hit at all. Now shoot, said Robin Hood. You shall each have three shots, and every one who fails to place his arrows within the garland. Shall forfeit the arrow and receive beside a box on the side of the head as stout as can be given. Can any one hit inside that little garland at such a distance? asked the king in amaze. Look and see, said Robin Hood proudly. First, David of Doncaster shot and lodged all three arrows within the garland, while the king looked on astonished. Then Midge, the miller's son, And he also placed all his arrows inside of the garland. Then Wat the tinker drew his bow, but he was unlucky, for one of his arrows missed the mark by the breadth of two fingers. Come here and take your punishment, called Robin Hood. The king supposed that since he had missed by so little, he would receive but a light tap, but he got a blow that knocked him spinning across the grass, heels overhead. Ha ha ha! Laughed his comrades, and 
oh ho thought king richard i am glad i am not in this but he was much impressed with the way robin hood's men obeyed him they are better to follow his commands than my servants are to follow mine he thought the shooting went on and most of the men shot their arrows within the garland but a few missed and received tremendous buffets last robin hood shot his first shaft split off a piece of the stake on which the garland was hung his second lodged a scant inch from the first but the last arrow he shot was feathered faultily and it swerved to one side and smote an inch outside of the garland then all the company roared with good-natured laughter for it was seldom indeed that they saw their master miss go and take your punishment master said midge the miller's son i hope it will be as heavy as watts well said robin hood i will forfeit my arrow to our guest and take my buffet from him now the merry robin was somewhat crafty in this for though he did not mind hard knocks at all he did not like the thought of being sent sprawling before his band the hands of the churchmen were soft and their strongest blows but feeble for they did not work nor use their muscles much but the pretended abbot bared an arm so stout and muscular that it made the yeomen stare robin hood placed himself fairly in front of him and he struck such a blow that would have felled an ox down went robin hood on the ground rolling over and over and his men fairly shouted with laughter well said robin hood sitting up half dazed i did not think that there was an arm in england that could strike such a blow who are you man i'll warrant you are no churchman as you seem then richard threw his cowl and robin knew his king if he had been a disloyal man as well as an outlaw he would have trembled then but though he knelt at the king's feet and signalled all his men to kneel his voice was not ashamed your majesty he said you have no subjects in all england more loyal to you than i and my merry men we have done no evil except to certain of the greedy and rich who oppressed your subjects we crave your pardon if we have done wrong and we beg for your protection and swear that we will ever serve you faithfully then the king looked down in amazement that an outlaw should speak so but he knew men and he knew what people said of robin hood and he knew too that he was the best archer in all england and he wanted him in his own train i will forgive all your law-breaking he said if you will come with me to my court and serve me there you shall take little john and will scarlet and allen a dale who is the sweetest singer i ever heard and the rest of your men i will make into royal rangers since i judge they can protect sherwood forest better than any others so robin hood left the greenwood and went to the king's court and he served king richard well but he did not like the confinement of the court and could not abide the gaieties and jealousies of the courtiers after king richard died his brother john took the throne and he was one of the worst kings that ever ruled england then robin hood went back to the forest and his merry men gathered around him once more and again they became outlaws, and there in the forest he lived till he died. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of the Story of Robin Hood – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Robin Hood – by Bertha Evangeline Bush Chapter 7 Death of Robin Hood Now the manner of Robin Hood's death was in this wise. He had grown to be an old man, and he became ill of a fever. I will go to my cousin, the prioress of Kirkley's, for she hath much knowledge of healing, he said. I will ask her to bleed me, that I may become well. In those days the women had more knowledge of healing than any others, for it was the duty of every mother and daughter to learn as much as she could about it, that she might know what to do if her husband or her son were wounded. 
This cousin of Robin Hood's was greatly indebted to him, for she had got her good place as prioress, but she loved one of his enemies, and she dealt treacherously with him. She opened a vein in his arm, but, but she did not close it up again. Then she left him alone in a high room at the very top of the priory to bleed to death. All day long he bled till he was so weak that he could hardly move. But at evening he managed to lift his bugle to his lips and blow. The blast was but feeble, but little John heard it, for, though the prioress refused to let him in with Robin Hood, he had lingered as close to his dear master as he could get all day long. The prioress locked the great entry door so that he might not come in, and he seized a huge stone mortar that three men could not lift ordinarily and hurled it against the door, crashing it in. Then he dashed up the winding stairs, and none could stay him until he reached the room under the eaves where his master lay. But he saw at a glance that Robin Hood was dying. Master, he cried, I will burn the priory down over the heads of these vile nuns whose mistress has done you such dreadful treachery. No, no, said Robin Hood with a smile that was feeble, but was wondrous sweet. I have never hurt a woman in my life, nor allowed my followers to do it. I could not allow such a thing now. And with almost his last breath, he made Little John promise to do no injury to the treacherous nun who had killed him. There are many stories about Robin Hood. There is not enough space here to put down half of them. I hope you will ask for them at the library and read them all, and some of the quaint old ballads about him too, and I hope, most of all, that every boy who reads them will try to be as kindly and as helpful and as generous and as brave and chivalrous to all womankind as Robin Hood was. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Story of Robin Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Story of Robin Hood by Bertha Evangeline Bush. Robin Hood and Allen a Dale. Come listen to me, you gallant so free, all you that love mirth for to hear, and I will tell you of a bold outlaw that lived in Nottinghamshire. As Robin Hood in the forest stood, all under the greenwood tree, there he was aware of a brave young man, as fine as fine might be. The youngster was clad in scarlet red, in scarlet fine and gay, and he did frisk it over the plain, and chaunted a round delay. As Robin Hood next morning stood, amongst the leaves so gay, there did he espy the same young man come drooping along the way. The scarlet he wore the day before, it was clean cast away, and at every step he fetched a sigh. Alas, and well a day! Then stepped forth brave little John, and Midge the miller's son, which made the young man bend his bow when he saw them come. Stand off, stand off, the young man said. What is your will with me? You must come before our master straight, under yon greenwood tree. And when he came bold Robin before, Robin asked him courteously, O oh, hast thou any money to spare for my merry men and me? I have no money, the young man said, but five shillings and a ring, and that I have kept the seven long years to have at my wedding. Yesterday I should have married a maid, but she was from me tain, and chosen to be an old knight's delight, whereby my poor heart is slain. What is thy name? then said Robin Hood. Come tell me without any fail. By the faith of my body, then said the young man, 
My name it is Alan a Dale. What wilt thou give me, said Robin Hood, in ready gold or fee, to help thee to thy true love again, and deliver her unto thee? I have no money, then quoth the young man, in ready gold nor fee, but I will swear upon a book thy true servant for to be. How many miles is it to thy true love? Come tell me without guile. By the faith of my body, then, said the young man, it is but five little mile. Then Robin he hasted over the plain, he did neither stint nor lin, until he came unto the church, where Alan should keep his wedding. What dost thou hear, the bishop then said, I prithee now tell unto me. I am a bold harper, quoth Robin Hood, and the best in the north country. O oh, welcome, O oh, welcome, the bishop, he said, that music best pleaseth me. You shall have no music, said Robin Hood, till the bride and bridegroom I see. With that came in a wealthy knight, which was both grave and old, and after him a finikin lass did shine like the glistering gold. This is not a fit match, quoth Robin Hood, that you do seem to make here, for since we are come into the church, the bride shall choose her own dear. Then Robin Hood put his horn to his mouth, and blew blast two or three, when four and twenty yeomen bold came leaping over the lee. And when they came into the churchyard, marching all in a row, the first man was Alan Adale to give bold Robin his bow. This is thy true love, Robin, he said. Young Alan, as I hear say, and you shall be married this same time before we depart away. That shall not be, the bishop cried, for thy word shall not stand. They shall be three times asked in the church, as the law is of our land. Robin Hood pulled off the bishop's coat, and put it upon little John. By the faith of my body, then Robin said, this cloth doth make thee a man. When little John went into the choir, the people began to laugh. He asked them seven times into church, lest three times should not be enough. Who gives me this maid? said little John. Quoth Robin Hood, that do I. And he that takes her from Allen a Dale, full dearly he shall buy. And then, having ended this merry wedding, the bride looked like a queen. And so they returned to the merry green wood, amongst the leaves so green. Author Unknown End of Chapter 8 End of the Story of Robin Hood by Bertha Evangeline Bush